Welcome to this special live webcast brought to you by the Conference Board, along with our sponsor, Root. Please ask questions through the chat box on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, and our panelists will answer as time permits. This webcast qualifies for CPE, HRCI, and SHRM credits. You can request credit in the box on the lower right. If you would like CPE credit, you must also click the box that appears on your screen three times during this program. Also, we ask that you please Hi, everybody, and welcome to Thriving in 2021. We have the secrets to optimizing your employee engagement today, and we are glad that you are with us. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping notes. So you can earn CPE credits. Just click the link in the CEU request pod, and, and it's in the right-hand corner of the webcast console, and you'll sign up for credits. You have to stay online for the entire webcast, so you're going to have to endure everything that Meredith and I have to say today in order to get those credits. And you'll see there are three uh, times that there will be pop-ups that you have to click OK for. Those will become apparent for you, so just do that during the program. And credit is only available if you participate live. Now, we're sure you're going to watch this over and over again, but to get those CPE credits, you need to do that live while you're with us. So that, that's the housekeeping. Let's move on to thriving in 2021 and unpacking those secrets to optimizing your employee engagement. Today, we have an interview with Jim Howden. He is the co-founder of Root, Inc and the author of The Art of Engagement. We have Meredith Bellman, who is my coworker and friend, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, Meredith. Hi, Gary. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, so as you see on the screen, my name is Meredith Bellman. I'm a partner at Root. I've been at Root uh, about 11 years. My background is in customer experience primarily in retail, hospitality, and food service. Um, and I also lead our virtual engagement team, which is really what I'll be talking about today as we think about thriving in 2021 and engagement. Um, I'll be talking about how we can do that with our people virtually. So as always, thrilled to be here with you, Gary. Good to be with you, Meredith. And everybody, I'm Gary Magenta. I'm going to be your host today, and I'll be uh, interviewing Jim Howden and also be in conversation with Meredith. I'll also be your voice today in the chat box. So if you just go to that bottom left of your screen, you'll see a chat box that should be right above the word everyone. That means you're talking to everyone, not in private conversation. And just let us know where you're calling from today. That could be state, city, office or what room in the house. We just want to get you familiar with the chat feature and start the conversation because we want to hear from you. Phoenix, Pennsylvania, Utah, Minneapolis, Texas, Chicago, New York, Lebanon, New Jersey, New Jersey, New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey, so hi everybody. Alabama, Virginia, New York, Portland, boy, Bloomington, New Hampshire, Ohio, wow. from everywhere, Los Angeles. I'm not seeing anybody from a different country yet. Hello, Florida. I'm calling in from Florida today as well. Memphis, Tennessee, Missouri, Denver. Thank you. Nobody Ohio, said Gary. I'm locked. Oh, Tijuana just came in. Hey, Mark from Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, I see someone from the UK. We've got coast to coast. Awesome. And Canada and is in the know. house with Doris representing. So welcome, Doris, as well. Um, and we we're saying, is everybody, is anybody else hearing an echo? So let us know if you're hearing an echo in here as well. No echo. Sounds okay to me, so you may want to check your own piece. No echo from anybody else. User error. Welcome, everybody, <laughs> no matter where you're calling from. I was waiting for somebody to say, I am locked up in the closet at home to try to avoid the kids and the doorbells. But looks like um, we just got locations. So welcome today, and we are sure you're going to have a fun, engaging 
uh, hour with us and also learn a lot along the way. And we've got a few promises to kick off our next 56 minutes together. Meredith? Yeah, so in the next 54 minutes or so, um, there's really three major things that we're hoping we accomplish and that by the end of this time, you will feel better equipped to do. So the first one is that you will learn how to build an employee engagement approach um, for today's realities. So we'll be talking about current state, how things look in COVID, but also future state and how we, re how we can sustain engagement in the long run. The second thing is you'll understand how virtual events build emotional and intellectual connections that drive change. So we will help you use, how I like to say it is, really using virtual events and virtual engagement as a powerful tool in your toolbox to drive change in your organization. And then the third one is we'll give you a tangible set of tips to make all of your events, whether they're virtual or in person, more memorable and actionable. So hopefully these three things are what you signed up for, that you are super excited about. Um, and with that, let's dive in. Yeah, we're still up. We're 175, 176 strong. So nobody has dropped off after you've lifted the promises. So I think we're all in, Meredith. Let's unpack this. Okay. So let's just start by asking you all, what's the biggest challenge today in creating engagement with your employees? So a word, a short sentence, what is the biggest challenge you're experiencing in creating engagement with your teams? Remote, burnout, burnout. remote, stress, everyone is virtual, too much work, work. budget, getting participation, heavy, heavy workload, just the, the, the Zoom fatigue, saw that a lot. Lots of burnout. We also see leadership buy-in, COVID fatigue, lots of heavy workload too. So yep. just seems, Meredith, that people are under a tremendous amount of weight, whether it be isolation, the, the um, virus, workload. People are maxed out, says Catherine. Sure. Yep. That's interesting. Agreed. It's hard. We feel alone, so there's some loneliness. I see lack of connection, and yet we're burned out. So that is a recipe for things to be really difficult and for engagement to be an even heavier load than it typically is. So hopefully what we share today can help move the needle a little bit. Yeah, when you see all of that, Meredith, I think it's it's the time for, for the 185 people who are now with us to really be looking at this as – um, doubling down on engagement when people seem overloaded and maybe even have Zoom fatigue or meeting fatigue, it's actually not the time to back off. It's the time to change things up and look at engagement yeah. differently. So let's take a look at that. We have a, an interview with Jim Howden. As I said, he is the co-founder of Root Inc. He's the author of Art of Engagement. But what's most important for today's discussion is he's one of the foremost authorities on employee engagement. So let's spend a few minutes listening to the first half of a two-part interview that we have with Jim today. Let's go ahead and roll the interview. As we promised at the start of our session today, we have Jim Howden with us. Jim is the co-founder of Root Inc. and the author of The Art of Engagement, as well as being a leading authority in employee engagement. Jim, welcome and thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you know, when you think about this, this concept of engagement, we know that many organizations have been after it for years, for decades, but they're not really getting very far. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about what are some of the obstacles that some of these businesses are finding in creating employee engagement? You know, Gary, your observation is really an important one. You know, when you think about it as a community, as a society, whenever we put our mind to do something and seriously gone after it, we've, we've accomplished it. So two of those examples might be, you know, cancer deaths and the other might be traffic related deaths. And you know, over the last 30 years, cancer deaths are down almost 30% on average, and 
Same thing on traffic related fatalities, they're down 30%. And so, you know, it, 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 what we're doing is working. However, when you begin to think about employee engagement or employee disengagement, and you look at the last 30 years, we have not made any improvement. Uh, it's zero improvement. And so as a result, when you begin to think about it, 70% of people in most organizations wake up every day and almost sleepwalk through their organizational experience. And so maybe it's time we just think about this differently. Uh, maybe it's time that we begin to not survey people, but really begin to better understand about what engages people. And, and in many cases, what does not engage them? What is the obstacle to the engagement that we're all seeking? Because whatever we're doing is not working and it, um, it's time to rethink it. In, yeah, in I love ways. that visual of this of the sleepwalker. It's it's uh, I, I think a really accurate depiction of what we see in many organizations. Jim, let's dig into the to those six obstacles that I've heard you talk about before. I think our uh, participants today would like to learn more about the six specific that you've seen. You know, again, Gary, I think people are engaged in all parts of their life, just not at work. And so, you know, for the last thirty plus years, we've probably engaged uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 million people in their organizations through the things we've done. And, and we've taken a lot of notes. And so I think the first real obstacle to engagement is, you know, people cannot be engaged if they're scared. They can't be engaged if they feel it's not safe to really say what they think and feel. You know, in many cases, truth telling as a, as a cultural competency is not there. And, and what I think we really have to understand is just because we say it's safe, it's not. We have to go to extraordinary lengths to create a culture where psychological safety is really part of what people recognize and what they, they think and feel. So, you know, you really have to ask about the whole question about being scared and I can't be engaged. You can't be engaged if you lack the big picture. I mean, I think there's in many cases we've talked to, to people across many different organizations and, you know, in times they say that their their leaders are kind of messed up or screwed up or or they even use the word idiots and and the reason they say that is because they're often sitting there getting as if it's a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle a different piece every week you know one says take risks the other says be reliable you know one says cut costs the other says invest and and they just say why can't we send the cover of the box top of that thousand piece puzzle across so we can see how all this fits together and and it's a critical element of beginning to really think about the business, not just be told what to do and, and execute somebody else's conclusions. And then I think the third obstacle to engagement that really comes up often is just confusion. You know, I cannot tell you how many times we've been in, a, in organizations where words like operational excellence or customer intimacy or entrepreneurship get used but people are confused of what do we really mean by that? There's a lot of different ways to define that. And we just lack the ability to really go from familiar words to shared meaning and the, the precision that's required, you know, when people really get it, you know, if, if they're confused, they don't get it. They're going to be timid. They're going to sit back. They're going to wait and see. And I think all three of these obstacles of being scared of lacking the big picture and of being confused about what it is really that we're going to go do, uh, whether it's by team by team or by as an organization or or individually. Yeah, this this one on confused, they all resonate. I'm sure they do with our our participants as well. But this one on confused, I can't take action on something I don't understand. So we, you know, we, Gary, and what's worse, if I do take action and I get I get criticized for that because I misinterpret it, I'll never come back again. You know, of course, and all of this of the time has been sort of you know, chastised for doing something. We thought it was what you were asking, but it wasn't. And so, you know what, I'm just going to go back and wait and uh, and and wait it out because I'm not going to let that happen again. Yeah, because I think people are taking action with positive intent, but clearly don't understand the big picture, as you've said. Yeah, yep. great. Why don't you take us you know, to number the, four? Yeah, the fourth obstacle is overwhelmed. You know, I, I think that if you really look at it, um, you know, we, we we find that the one word that people use most often, especially during this pandemic, is I just feel overwhelmed. And so I think that the, the need to simplify, uh, the, the need to, to really find a way to take burden out of what people have to wrestle with 
you know, we find in a lot of our research <clears throat> that the high performers know how to simplify. And sometimes the average performers just don't know what not to do. And so it becomes a real obstacle to engagement. And that is, if I'm overwhelmed, I just try to play almost the whack-a-mole children's game every day. And I really, really uh, don't give my best. It's it's just a survival mindset and a survival mentality. The fifth one is is really an interesting one, and you know we we sort of said I can't be engaged if I'm a renter, and 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 this is really simple in in this sense. Most of the time, leaders talk about how do we get buy-in, how do we get people to to buy in and to to own this and believe it, and and you know and and it tends to still be a pep rally, a town hall meeting you know, maybe a, a one-way communication. I can't tell you, you know, how many times we've seen the, the old Chinese proverb, and that is, tell me, I'll forget, show me, I may remember, involve me, I'll understand. And I think that the essence of this ownership is that you really have to be in dialogue and conversation to go from a, a renter to an owner. And so, you know, the obstacle here is that, you know, we can't have ownership go from a leader's or a manager's lips to a follower's heart and head. It, it really has to occur because they are engaged and they really, you know, have a chance to co-think the business. This concept of renter to owner is a great one. If I'm writing it down and we've been working together for 20 years, I can only imagine what people on the other side of this yeah. uh, interview are doing right now. So, um, you know, and, and the last one, Gary, uh, implementer is, is kind of close to this renter. You know, we've used a lot and and you use you've uh, used a lot the concept that people will tolerate the conclusions of their leaders, but they'll act on their own. And, you know, and, and the obstacle here is that we tell our people what to think versus ask them to co-think. And, and, and this the renter and the implementer are the same. I think the, the, the challenge here is that Many times we hear leaders say, well, the strategy is done and now it's your turn to go execute it. And, and the fact of the matter is that we script that for them. And the fact that we script it means that it, it's going to be dead on arrival. Uh, the real key here is to see people not as just implementers, but as creators. To use the human variability as an asset and not try to sort of squash it out because we script what they have to do. And and, and, and people are creators. You know, the, the, the real obstacle here is the belief that if people bring their own ideas that it, and the variability of that, that we might get off track. The fact of the matter, extraordinary is off track. And so how do we sort of liberate that capability of human beings to bring their creative ideas, to bring their, you know, innovative actions and, and to bring their thoughtful challenges? And the way to do that is not to think of them as an implementer of somebody else's ideas and somebody else's thinking, but to, to liberate their own. And it's to go beyond the implementer to the creator. And in many cases, uh, uh, that's what really needs to happen. And that's where excellence really resides. Jim, uh, I just want to remind everybody that we're going to get everybody these six, so you don't have to feverishly write them down. We will get them to you. But Jim, thank you. We're going to come back to you and do some more of this interview in a bit. But with these great six that you just brought us, these six obstacles to engagement, we want to hear a little bit from Meredith on how do you overcome these obstacles. So Jim, thank you for being here, and we'll be back to this interview in just a few minutes. Hey, Gary. Welcome okay. back. Okay. So what we did is promise that you're going to share how to overcome these obstacles. We just heard from Jim on the six, and they can seem really overwhelming. And they are the notes that we've taken from all the companies we've been working with for the last 30 years on the obstacles that they are experiencing. What can we do to help people understand how to move past these obstacles or hop over them? Yeah, so let's talk about overcoming them. Not a tall order at all. So <laughs> Easy peasy. All good. Yeah. Well, and I think first I'll speak to it really in, from a first-person standpoint and how we do this for ourselves at Root because this is ultimately our area of expertise, really helping organizations increase and enhance engagement and overcome those six obstacles. So, and I think it starts for how we do it for ourselves. 
So what you see on the screen here is Roots Purpose. We exist and we get out of bed every morning to invigorate the power of human beings to make a difference. And if we think about those six obstacles that Jim just talked about, um, invigorating human beings, even in that wording, really help, like the objective of, of our purpose is to overcome those, those obstacles. So just by invigorating and helping human beings see the difference they can make, we remove those barriers of feeling scared, of feeling confused, of being a renter, of not knowing how you are an implementer within your organization. Um, and so these are the things that we do for ourselves every day and that we do for our clients. So um, I'm also just going to tell a quick story about how we do this for ourselves. And to me, this photo really represents it in one snapshot. So what you're looking at on the screen is actually all of us who work for Root. So about 170 of us. We did this last year at an all-company retreat. Feels like it was 10 years ago at a time when we could still stand shoulder to shoulder with each other. Um, but we did this in Ann Arbor. I think I saw a couple people in Detroit or Ann Arbor. Or someone's in Toledo. So regardless of your uh, college or team affiliation, uh, I think we can still agree this is a pretty cool picture. And what we did is we had two roosters, uh, Vicki and uh, Angie, who took it upon themselves to really think about how can we come together as a company and create something that is bigger than all of us and something that will be memorable for all of us. So they um, really led this project. So we all got in the stadium. You can see they had taped out our logo on the field. And then each of us got an 11 by 17 colored piece of paper. And then ultimately what we did was we spelled out our, our logo in, in our colors. And why I show this to you and why to me it represents overcoming those obstacles um, oh, I see a little trash talking happening. Big, big in the trash day. talking going on here. <laughs> I'm I'm difficult because I'm from Ohio, but I went to U of M, so I'm both a Buckeye and a Wolverine. It's very confusing for my family. Um, but so anyway, so why this represents that to me is because each of us stood there with our 11 by 17 piece of paper, knowing exactly the spot that we filled with each other, um, and how we contributed to this bigger picture. So all in this one moment, we were all uh, implementers and creators and our variability, and I love what Jim said at the end of that interview, where the extraordinary is off track and that we have to account for the human variability as an asset. So each of us, in our unique contribution, stood part of this larger root picture. And we were able to feel a, a part of that bigger picture feel a sense of belonging, and each of us contribute. So in doing that, we, over, we overcome, we overcame in that moment, but we overcome every day those obstacles. Um, and I think then, as you can see, the output or the outcome is something really useful. Yeah, the, the outcome to me, Meredith, is there was a strategy. It was executed yep. in a really short time frame with everyone's participation, and they knew exactly where they fit in to that overall big picture. So they saw the big picture and understood where they fit in. That's exactly right, Gary. I think we were all engaged in intellectually, emotionally, um, socially, because we were together, and behaviorally, in that we knew all the elements coming together and we could all see it. Yeah. Um, and we were all shared a vision and knew exactly how we were part of it. Yeah, I think it's so worthy that we overcome those obstacles. For sure. What did you say? Thank you. Thank you for the story. Yeah. And I think it's worth mentioning that I was giving a speech that day and I didn't get to participate in this. And I would like to, in the future, be photoshopped in there somewhere just so I could feel a part of the whole. <laughs> and I can say, I'm like the fourth person from, I'm in the pink. Um, like the fourth person away from yeah. the blue. So I remember exactly where I was, my little team of pink pink people, um, and it was a really special moment. Yeah. So I think all of us felt and continue to feel engaged and part of something bigger than ourselves, which 
you know, Jim talked about in the interview and we'll talk about in part two as well, um, you know, is one of the keys to engage. Yeah, that sense of belonging. Yeah, right? I saw so many of you uh, mentioned burnout, feeling lonely, and obviously when we did this, it was in person, and we'll talk a little bit later about virtual engagement, but I think the principles are still the same. Sure. Thanks for sharing the picture and the metaphor and the story. Uh, uh, thank you. Let's, let us just do a little bit more and dig into, we understand the obstacles. You've helped us understand really that idea of that big picture and being a part of something bigger than yourself. And, and Jim digs into what he calls the roots of engagement. And this comes from his book, The Art of Engagement. And so let's just hear a little bit more from Jim on what those key roots are to create the type of feeling and connection that you were just talking about, Meredith. So let's go back to the interview, and we'll be back in conversation in just a minute. We are back with our second half of our interview with Jim Howden, author of The Art of Engagement. So Jim, you know a lot about the roots of engagement, what it takes to really make sure that people are not just surviving in engagement, but truly thriving in an engaged way in their organization. Share with us, share with all of our participants today, if you would, what are those roots of engagement? Thanks, Gary. You know, the, um, the roots of engagement, and we found four of them. You know, every place we saw something going on that was uh, stellar and something that was really, you know, exemplary, you know, we found that these four things were present. Um, and, you know, for three of them, we'll just touch on them. And one I'd like to go a little more in depth on, but, but the first one is people really want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And so when you begin to think about this, this is very much around purpose and cause. And you know, and the story that I think we've often heard um, really is, is, is close to this. And, and it's worth repeating, uh, at least the one that I've heard a lot, and that is it's the story about the cathedral. You know, and, and what it talks about is, you know, you walk up to a construction site and your first person comes up and asks uh, the gentleman what he's doing. And he says, you know, can't you see I'm laying bricks? It's pretty simple. And he walks up to the second one and he says to that gentleman, what are you doing? And, and he has a little better answer, but he says, you know, I, I'm building a wall. But it's the third person that he walks up to and asks the same question in terms of what are you doing, that the response is kind of uh, different. And the response is, you know, I'm building a cathedral that will stand for years for people and their families to worship in ways that are meaningful to them. And so this whole concept of being part of something bigger than yourself is pivotal. You know, we know that the organizations that have purpose you know, have returned six times greater than those that don't. We know from firms of endearment that, you know, sometimes the growth is 10 times greater. And so this whole issue around a cause, you know, a why is really pivotal in terms of being able to, to foster engagement. And it's really the first route. And that is that people do want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And they're willing to, to dedicate themselves to that when they find it and, and when they can become part of it. Yeah, great story. I think, when you, story. I think when you think of the second route, Gary, it's um, it's 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 being valued and feel a sense of belonging, and uh, those those are really important, <clears throat> um, you know, and and they're really critical. I I often ask in a, you know in an audience two questions, and I'm still stunned at the, at the answer, and and or the lack of the answer might be a better way to say it. But the first the first question is. When was the last time you really felt listened to? You know, and, and people, I say, just pause for a second. When was the last time you really felt listened to? Um, and, and I say, okay, now that you've thought about it, raise your hand if it's been within the last two weeks. All right, how about the last two months? How about the last six months? And it's, it's just, it's, it's gut-wrenching in terms of how few people really felt that. And then the second question is, when was the last time that you felt what you did matter or made a difference? And so this concept of being of value and, and really feeling a sense of belonging because of that value is, is really pivotal. Um, we often tell a story in, in how fragile this sense of being valued can be and, and belonging. 
And I think it's more interesting at the time of our pandemic than ever because it's it's more it's more vital than ever. And so, you know, I, I tell a quick story, and I'll do this uh, rather quickly because, it, you know, sometimes I like to tell it long. And and but you know, let's assume that you had a six-year-old daughter, and she decided that she really wanted to play soccer for the first time. And you know, and and you got her the um, the knee pads, the jersey, obviously, and and a ball, and she practiced. Uh, in the backyard before she went to the first the first meeting. And by the way, the first meeting you signed up to to bring treats and um, and you even got a sticker to put on the back of your 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 SUV that sort of was the name of the team. And and so she went to the first practice on Tuesday, this the second practice on Thursday, went to the game on Saturday, and the first half went by and she didn't get in. And the second half went by and she didn't get in. And I asked parents what would they do? You know, and I said, you're a good parent. And so, you know, most of the good parents would say, you know, I just would encourage you to try harder. And we we did some tutoring with her on the in her backyard again with, you know, how to kick the ball. And, and again, she went to practice the second week uh, after you were enthralled, in, enthralled with this opportunity for her to play. And she went to practice Tuesday and Thursday, went to the game on Saturday. And again, she did not get in. And so now I say, well, what would you do as a parent? You know, and and um, and, you know, typically what somebody would say is I might go up and talk to the coach and the coach says, well, she's kind of fragile and junior and and really, you know, just learning the game. So I didn't want to put her in and 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 you kind of nodded your head, but you didn't believe it. And so she went to practice the third week. Uh, Tuesday, she was there. Thursday, she was there. She um, was at the game on Saturday. She didn't get in uh, on the first half. And so. You know, I said, she, now it's the second half and she's still not in. It's three weeks into the season. She's not seen the field. I said, what are you thinking? You know, and I said, you know, pretend you had a glass of wine and you tell the truth. And and typically what people will say, well, we just wish one of the little boys or little girls on our team would, you know, stumble and maybe skin and knee, no blood. But somebody gets hurt, so they have to come out and she can go in, you know. And, and so just so she gets a chance to play and gets a chance to show what she's capable of. And so I said, OK, now it's the fourth week. Um, you know, again, she goes to practice on Tuesday. The frustration's pretty strong. And I said, and she goes on Thursday and now she gets in. And in it's the first half and she doesn't get in. Um, and I said, now the second half starts and two adults, two college educated parents who have been yeah. through this whole experience start to do something that's rather strange and they start to cheer for her team too yeah. and i pause for a second and then somebody shouts it out and they say lose and i just and I did said, it Jim. i just i just said it out loud yeah yes. you know and i said you know it's four short weeks I'm absolute advocate and enthralled to cheering for the team to lose and i said just just for a second, that's what's happening in our organizations. When people don't feel valued, when people don't feel like they belong, you just went and did it with your own child. But in many cases, exactly when people do, do feel disenfranchised, what's it cause, causes them to do? And so I can't tell you how important it is not to take the sense of value, being valued and belong for granted, especially at a time during a pandemic. Because when people, here's here's another way to think about it, Gary, and that is when people don't feel valued, they'll spend all their time trying to get it and justify it for themselves rather than create it for somebody else. And just the opposite when you do feel valued. You spend all your, your time comment, trying to create it for someone else. Yeah, I think your comment on it, it's only short, four short weeks. Engagement is so fragile that it can go from fully engaged to completely disengaged in the same month. So yeah, great point there. So true. So true, Gary. The third, the third route, and I just want to, is to go on a meaningful journey. Um, it, you know, the the word here that we don't have, but could probably fit in here, is adventure. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard leaders and individuals talk about, you know, what is it we want to create that doesn't exist, that we'd be willing to endure some sacrifice to bring it to life. That's what people are are motivated around. That's what really creates meaning and momentum. And so, you know, what is that adventure we want to go on? You know, not just what's the PowerPoint that has, you know, the EBITDA that we want to achieve um, when it comes to real engagement. And then the last one 
is, you know, people really want to know that their contribution makes a significant impact or difference in the lives of another human being. Um, and, and this is powerful too. And, and I think what happens is so often we're all cogs in a wheel, but we don't see it, what that wheel is of other people. And so, you know, how do you make that more obvious? How do you make the connection? How do you create the, the humanity between the creator and the user? Um, and so that becomes a real important thing to do in organizations that really recognize that if we could go after these four roots uh, and really make them come to life, that we might change the experience of our people and then change the experience of our organization and those we serve. Yeah. Jim, the roots of engagement are simple and thank you for sharing them. Thanks for sharing the obstacles. We enjoyed having you today. And I'm, I know that everybody appreciates your expertise. I'm gonna go back and talk to Meredith and thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Gary. Hey, Meredith. Yep, so, time. Yeah, really good stuff. Hope that uh, our participants have enjoyed learning more about the roots of engagement as well. What really stands out to me is this sense, especially today, that people want to feel a sense of belonging. They really want to be attached to something and something bigger than just themselves. And the other thing that really always gets me is this idea of appeal appealing to the higher level of thinking of our people. I mean, we hire smart people. We have to really listen to what they're thinking, use what they're thinking, value the thoughts that they have, and include them in our everyday work. So in order to do that, we've got to engage them. And today is more difficult than ever on the journey to do that. So I'm going to ask you, Meredith, to talk a little bit about how we engage people in events. Yeah, thanks Gary. Let's do it. So speaking of appealing to a high level of thinking, let's just take a breather, take a beat for a second. Uh, and what says high level of thinking more than print? So we just wanted to check in for a minute, make sure everyone's still paying attention, whether or not you're getting your credits. And let us know, on a scale of print, how are you doing? Choose a picture, 1 through 12, that represents where you're at. Uh, let's, let's chat about it. Yeah, lots of threes, four 12s, a bunch of sixes in a row. Six 12s, fours, sixes, all right. 10, 11. Again, lots of sixes. So people are smiling. Seven. Oh, I was hoping someone would answer that. All right. So all over, what I'm not seeing is a lot of ones, although Juliana has one as soon as I said that. Not seeing any twos, because that requires the support group uh, membership, yeah. um, for sure. Agreed. And <laughs> yeah, 11, but pretty yeah. much everywhere else. But lots of sixes, a couple of 12s, a lot of threes as well. Awesome. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'm glad to see that there's no uh, no. Twos. Where are you, Meredith? That's a, that's a different. That's a different webinar. Yep. Uh, I think I'm nine, checking things out, feeling pretty good. What about you, Gary? I'm sort of perpetually in the five. Like, you talking to me? That's, I'm, I'm perpetually there. And so is Kimberly. Kimberly and I are both on the five. What? Why are you talking to me? What? <laughs> Jeremy, before I talk about virtual engagement, I did see a question in here um, from Tanya. Said, I did not really understand root of engagement number three, going on an adventure. Do you want to say anything about that real quick? Well, I think we have to help people understand the journey that they're on, right? So think about that big picture. Um, it's an adventure. We're going from A to B. That's what business is about almost every day, right? We're at point A. We've got to get to point B. And how we engage people in that journey and that adventure is really important. Are we slogging through it or are we rooted in a purpose? Do we understand the big picture of why change? What's changing? And how do I change in order to help the organization to move in this direction? Where do I fit in? So when you think about that adventure, that journey, it's really about creating that roadmap for people 
so that they understand where we are today, where we're going tomorrow, what our desired future state is, what we have to focus on to get there and how I fit in. That's the story that we tell people in order to bring them along. Yep. Awesome. We, okay. We've got, we've got, Kash wants to know, is there a word that describes the scale 1 to 12? Prince. Prince. It's all about Prince. You're welcome, Tanya. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's jump and talk about virtual engagement, because as we think about engagement in our current reality, part of that for all of us, even if you are still going to the office, or you have folks who are still going to offices, or you've got some people in person, no matter what, there's still an element of engagement that has to be done virtually. And my belief, and what we've seen at Root, is that virtual engagement does not have to be a second best or a consolation prize, but that when done well, it truly is a powerful tool in your toolbox and can bring to life the four roots of engagement that Jim just talked about. So I'm going to share some of the ways that we, um, we use virtual engagement, we, we use the tools available, and then give you a couple of tips and tricks that hopefully you can take back to your organization and help folks, again, feel a part of something bigger than themselves, appeal to that higher level thinking, and go on those meaningful journeys. Because change takes time. Um, and engaging people is an ongoing thing. Believe me, I wish it, you know, just like working out, you can't just work out once and for all. Gosh, do I wish we could, but we can't. So <laughs> it's got to be something you do over time. So when we think about b building a virtual event or engaging people virtually, and I should qualify by saying when I say virtual event, I don't just mean, you know, thousand person of conferences. I truly mean any size, anywhere where you are engaging people who are in different locations um, remotely. So whether it's your team meeting of 10 people, or it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, or it is, you know, a 3,000 or 10,000 person event, the building blocks and some of the concepts and principles remain the same. And so for every virtual event or virtual engagement, there's really three building blocks. There's content, experience, and human connection. And you can't just think of one or two of these to really create a meaningful, actionable, um, and successful virtual engagement. You've got to do all three. So the first one, your content's got to drive. You know, figure out what your content is, what information you need to convey and then choose the right vehicle and the right form for it. But then also use, think about how you can build it into an experience. And the beauty of you know, one of the silver linings of what's going on right now is there are so many platforms and tools that we are readily available where you can really build experiences um, that help bring your content to life. And then the third is facilitating human connection. So find those moments of print Find those moments of interactivity of chat where you can bring people together and uh, facilitate dialogue and conversation. And at root, we take those building blocks and we put them through the lens of, a, of this 5E experience framework. Some of you may have seen this before, um, but really this is the underpinning of all events and experiences that we create, whether it's virtual or in person. And the way that this works, every experience we have as human beings, we go through these five milestones. Uh, we learn about an event, we enter it, we go through it, we leave, and then there's whatever follow-up. And I think the opportunity here for all of you in your organization is all the experiences you create or meetings, um, and again, especially your virtual engagement, put them through this 5E framework. Think about what are your communications ahead of time? How can you um, help your, your people, your participants become aware of the event? Build anticipation. You know, just doing something that clears through the clutter a little bit and is a little bit different than what we see every day makes a huge difference. And if I think about a lot of the chats that you all put at the beginning 
of this webinar around burnout and loneliness and people looking for connection, thinking about crafting an experience through these five E's really combats burnout and loneliness and those things because it makes you like sit up a little bit taller in your chair, create, helps create um, multi-dimensionality of an event, and just helps all of us feel connected. Gary, anything you want to add there? We laid out the five E's, and whether you're conscious of them or not, whether you're focused on them or not, they are happening. It's your job to make sure that they happen in the right way. You're either enticing people to come or you're not. The opposite of enticing is not good. People are entering, are engaging or not, they're exiting, and they're, it's either lasting or it isn't. So just think about all of these, not as nice to have, but they are happening, and you are in control over what you want that outcome to be. You want to get people excited to be there. When they're there, you want to really give them the most they can possibly get out of the experience so that when they leave, they're excited to take action and that you make sure that action just isn't a hockey stick spike but can last over time by extending it. So whether or not you're focused on this, all of these things are happening. Are they happening in a way that will allow you to deploy and sustain your strategy? Yep. I think that's really well said. And a lot of events, we over-index maybe on entice or engage, and then we just drop off at the exit and the extend. Yeah. But in fact, well, and, and if you think about driving change, that is where change happens. So we need to spend more time yeah. on extend. And several people, sorry, I was yeah. anxious to share with you. Several people are saying that at the same time. Last event, we didn't have the extend. Did an event yesterday, didn't have exactly the, right. um, yep. the extend piece. And the framework is resonating, so let's, awesome. let's continue to dig yep. in. So then tactically, how we use it at root, so our process, so letting you behind the curtain a little bit, which is why these aren't as pretty, um, but I thought this was helpful. And so our process, and I suggest you do the same, is we take then those three building blocks that I shared, so content, experience, um, and connection, and we put them through the filter or the framework of the five E's, and we map out an experience. So I know this slide is hard to read, and you don't really need to read the tactics of it. But the key here is that we take those blocks and we map them into an experience. So the idea here is that we're being really intentional. And if we talk about, you know, someone asked a question, Tanya, about going on a meaningful journey, we are literally mapping out from a virtual standpoint what a meaningful journey looks like. So we are ensuring that that meaningful journey happens. Um, and this is really what we do for ourselves and how we work with clients as well. So I want to share just a couple. I'll kind of fly through these, but just some tactical tips of how you can um, bring the things that I just shared to life, again, both in person and virtually, um, over, you know, not, again, not just right now during COVID, but I really view these not as a stopgap, not as a band-aid, but for the long term to help engage your people and create change in your organization. Yeah. Meredith, I just want to pause for a second because we got to, I think um, as in our rehearsal, that map that you, um, the plan uh -huh. that you put out is um, lighting okay. some sparks. Um, so one of the questions is, are you able to share the mapping tool and maybe, um, and I had said to you, I love that it looks like a big, you know, party. Yeah. It's, it looks like confetti. It's great. So maybe could you just spend another minute here on this? Is this something that somebody's able to do for themselves? Is this your creation? Yeah, so it's, it's both. So, I am, you know, we use our experience to create a good flow and really that meaningful journey of an event. The actual tools you're looking at here, some, are, some we just do in PowerPoint, some we use a virtual whiteboard tool. So if anyone's familiar with Mural or Miro, um, we use those tools so that we can collaborate virtually, which the one on the left here was done in Mural. And basically it's a virtual whiteboard where we can be our, you know, our virtual events team. Uh, we can collaborate and create um, these maps. Uh, 
doing it together while we're not physically together. So I guess the answer to can people do these on their own, yes. Also, this is what my team does. So we spend a lot of time doing these as well. But I do believe, you know, there's a time and a place, so I do believe people can do these for themselves as well. Use the socks and the Thank five keys. They sort of do a lot of the work for you. Um, all right, let me get into some tactical tips. So the first one is to create opportunities for discussion and connection. So this seems a little bit obvious, but I think um, we often forget to do this. You know, we get so caught up in talking and like the one way just talking at people that we forget to really build opportunities for connection. So, um, and help people, again, appeal to that higher thinking and feel a part of something bigger than themselves. So a lot of the platforms, whether you use Zoom or Teams or WebEx or whatever you use, have, have built-in tools, whether it's annotation, points, chat, et cetera, that can help you create discussion. And what you see on the screen are just a couple screenshots of how we creatively use those. So I love this one in the top right where we use the WebEx annotation tools to do a word search. You know, and it's just a small moment in the middle of a meeting. We did that with about 20 people to just break it up, you know, and take a beat. Um, or this one in the bottom, in the bottom right, where we had people fill in some responses, and then we can call on them and have a discussion. So, yeah, not surveys, but discussion, where people can tell stories um, and really share where they're at, which actually brings me to tip number two, which is leverage storytelling. You notice that when I, earlier when I shared that root logo picture, like, that was just a story. We, you know, there are webinars and classes about the importance of storytelling. It is just as critical when you are doing a virtual event and to engage people. And whether you're using film or visualization or conversation, the ability to share stories, create stories, and connect through stories is as important as, as ever. And as you're building any kind of event or meeting or engagement, build in time to share stories. I'm just going to finish. There's two more that I want to fly through, and then we'll, have, then we'll stop for more discussion. So number three is mix up modalities. So what you're looking at here is an event we did for Procter & Gamble about a month ago. And we went in the same about hour time. We went from video to a panel discussion to giving people time to self-reflect with a workbook. So we are re really creating multidimensional um, experiences that give that sort of keep people on their toes, help them pay attention, but also just mix up the modality. We, none of us want to just stare at a screen all day long. So mixing it up, um, I think, is if there's one takeaway, this might be it. And then don't forget also that you can use tangible materials too. It's, it's the holiday season. Everyone loves getting packages. Send something in the mail, whether it's a ring light or it's, um, it's snap or content relevant stuff. This, what you're looking at here was a, um, a package that we did a root meeting about a month ago or two months ago, and we sent all of these branded packages to everyone. It was a great conversation starter, and it literally felt like my birthday um, in, in September. It was fabulous. Yeah, there's a few things on this, Merit. Getting somebody something physical in the mail is great. It's a great way to sort of entice, right? Then it's, it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, if you put in uh, a granola bar in there, what's fun is that even though people aren't together in this virtual environment, everybody has the same snack, just like at a conference. So it's just kind of cool to create that, that um, sense of belonging, even through something as simple as a granola bar. And then the last one, I think that's spot on, Gary. And then the last one is just to remember your pacing and to check in often. So again, don't be afraid of having a little bit of fun. If I refer back to, you know, our on a scale of prints, that was an example of just taking a beat, checking in, and having a little bit of fun. So um, this is another just way to mix things up and and engage people virtually so that they feel a part of something, 
you're going on those journey and you're really bringing to ultimately what we're doing is we're bringing the roots of engagement to life virtually. And I think if we're able to do that as organizations, so here's all four of these tips that hopefully, you know, can be small things, but can move the needle a little bit. And the goal here is that if we start to do these things more often, a little bit better, um, that we'll see engagement go up across organizations, which is really, you know, what, what we're here for and what gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Awesome. So I think we're going to ask a question. Thank you, Mary. The tips are, are, the tips are great, and I know that we've got questions, so why don't we go and spend the next few minutes that we have on a couple of questions before our okay. friends at Conference Board wrap us up. So um, we've been sending sales teams lots of packages. It's been great, says Deborah. So they, Deborah agrees. Um, Jessica says great tips. Um, what questions do you have for me or for Meredith? <laughs> Don't be shy. Okay, so we've got lots of people typing. Multiple yeah. attendees are typing. Now I'm waiting in anticipation. <laughs> Me too. There's so many typing, we can't get it through the funnel yet. <laughs> I'm glad yet. to see that some people have been sending lots of packages. I think that's really nice and makes a big difference. Yep. So, here we go. What platforms are great for interaction? We have a company account with WebEx, Zoom, and it... Uh, uh, isn't seen as secure enough. We also have Microsoft Teams. Yeah, so, at, so at Root, we are we pride ourselves on being pretty platform universal, um, and all of the platforms have tools built in for interaction. I think WebEx has made some great strides and updates. Um, so you can use WebEx. Zoom has some, and Teams does as well. And there's more Teams updates coming soon. Um, so I think all of those are good for interaction. If you have a company account with WebEx, they've got, they just installed emojis that are fun, the annotation tools everyone can use, um, and Teams has some fun things too that you can do with backgrounds. So all of those have different ways that you can create interactions in Zoom, um, inside of them. Yeah. So we are now inundated with questions and likely not all that much time for them, but um, let me hit a few very quickly. Um, what do you do if you only have 10 minutes? What do you do if you have no budget? Um, is there a template for that form that you showed before? Those three, maybe we can right, do we'll rapid fire on. Um, if, if I only have 10 minutes, I tell a story. Um, story is still the oldest and best way to engage people. Use visuals in that story. Use really simple data in the form of infographics. But tell a story and have people um, have the ability to participate in that story yep. or ask questions. And what, so in terms of the template, I can send, we can send out um, some, we can send out some pointers also on our website. And then I do want to just go, Dirk, I see your question where it seems like this assumes white collar professions. I actually don't think it does. I think the key part for, and as I said, I work a lot with hospitality and food service, so frontline workers. Really, the key is helping all folks, no matter their role, understand why what they do matters is important and ties to the bigger picture. So I actually think that the roots of engagement apply across the board and are universal. All levels, all industries. For everyone. Yeah. So we invite you to, um, we'll do some follow-up with you all, but we invite you to ask, come back and ask Meredith and I as many questions as you want. We'll be happy to set up phone calls with you. We know the conference board has a, a PSA that they need to do, and we are at the top of the hour. So we're going to hand it back to conference board. Thank all of you for being here, and please don't be shy. We're happy to answer questions outside of this format. Conference board? Okay, thank you so much, Gary. Thank you so much, Meredith, and Jim as well. If you enjoyed this program, please check out some of these upcoming human capital-related webcasts, or you can see our entire webcast lineup at conferenceboard.org slash webcast slash upcoming. For C-suite executives, 
we'd like to offer you an exciting opportunity to take part in the Conference Board's flagship C-Suite Challenge Survey for 2021, which identifies key strategies executives intend to use to meet critical business challenges and grow their companies. As a special thanks for completing the survey, you will be able to access copies of the final report, so please make sure to complete the survey by this Friday, December 4th, to ensure your input is included. Finally, if you're interested in collaborating with the Conference Board to produce another great program like what you saw here today, please reach out to us. You can discuss potential webcast sponsorship opportunities by contacting sponsorship at conferenceboard.org. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.